Afghanistan, where Soviet troops are now involved in Russia's biggest military engagement since Czechoslovakia in 1968. In the second week after the invasion, this was the scene on the outskirts of the Afghan capital, Kabul. Soviet troops were everywhere throughout the capital and the country. Moscow claimed they were there because they'd been invited by Corbu's new rulers after a coup d'etat. But that version of events found few believers elsewhere. Most governments saw it as simply an invasion of a foreign country, and support for the move was limited, even within the communist bloc. America's President Carter called it the greatest threat to peace since World War II. And though nobody else put it in quite those terms, it was clear the world community shared his concern. Que ceux qui sont en faveur du projet de résolution at the United Nations, the Security Council was presented with a resolution calling for the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan. The Soviet Union wasn't mentioned by name, and some nations, Britain, America and China, would have preferred a stronger resolution. Even so, out of 15 delegates, 13 voted for it. The two opposing votes came from the Soviet Union itself, of course, and East Germany. Le résultat du vote est le suivant. 13 votes en faveur. The Soviet veto pushed the crisis from the Security Council to the General Assembly. But in both forums, Moscow remained unapologetic. For the Russians, this was not an invasion, just a helping hand to a nation in need. Any other interpretation they dismissed as sheer hypocrisy or Western warmongering. But the Afghan crisis won't be easily dismissed, and a glance at the map shows why. Afghanistan, on Russia's southern frontier, also shares long borders with Iran and Pakistan, two countries at the center of the current turmoil in the Islamic world. Add the oil factor in Iran, the tribal unrest in both countries, together with the age-old Western fears of a Soviet push to a warm water port on the Indian Ocean, and it becomes easy to see why the world community is worried. Soviet involvement in Afghanistan goes back several years, even before the overthrow of the monarchy in 1973. But this was Moscow's first real protégé in Kabul. Mohammed Taraki became the first Marxist president of Afghanistan in April 1978, in what was widely seen as a Moscow-backed coup. Ironically, it was on this visit to Moscow in December 1978 the Taraki signed the friendship treaty that the Soviets are now quoting as the justification for their present action. Last September, Taraki was himself overthrown and killed by Hafizullah Amin, his prime minister. Amin's role was central to the current Afghan crisis. It was thought at first that he was even more Moscow's man than Taraki. But Western intelligence reports indicate this wasn't so. In fact, it's now believed that the palace shootout in which Taraki died last September had really been intended as a Soviet-backed plot to kill Amin. Even as premier, Amin had been ruthless with the Muslim opposition back home. As president, he cracked down even harder and promised the Russians stability within 30 days of his takeover. It was his failure to deliver that stability that led to his downfall at Christmas and set the air above Kabul throbbing with the sound of Soviet military aircraft. It's still not clear exactly what happened or when. But there is agreement that a Soviet intervention of some kind had been planned at least weeks in advance. Soviet troops have been arriving in increasing numbers since early December. Then, on Christmas Eve, the arrivals increased dramatically. For two days and nights, Soviet planes landed at Korbel Airport, bringing an airborne division of around 6,000 men. Helicopters, too, landed in front of the astonished gaze of airport passengers. 
Radio Corbel announced at first that President Hafizullah Amin had been deposed, found guilty of crimes against the people and executed. But it wasn't long before observers on the spot were piecing together a different story. Amin, it turned out, had been advised by the Russians to change palaces for his own security. The building was then attacked, some say by Soviet troops, and Amin was killed in the fighting. Troops loyal to him also died when they put up resistance from nearby buildings. The new president was named as Babrak Kamal, a political rival of Amin, whom he denounced as a puppet of the United States and a CIA agent. He thanked the Soviet Union for its aid and promised a more liberal regime for Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the Soviet military presence remained highly visible, even in its slightly more relaxed moments. Jogging troops were to be seen only in the safety of Korbel. Outside, it was a different story, as motorized divisions spread out across the country to take the provincial capitals. Our film crew tried to make contact, but language was a problem, despite some recent press cards issued in Moscow. I come from Moscow. I was in Moscow for three weeks at the, um, at the, Red, at the Red Square. You know, for the parade on November the 7th... This tank commander didn't seem to mind us filming at first, but he just wasn't sure how he ought to treat us. Shall we go down here? Shall we go down From the hillsides above, dug-in Soviet troops looked on impassively. The motorized divisions had crossed the land frontiers at the same time as the airlift into Korbul, and they'd met stiff resistance in several areas. In Kandahar, for example, southwest of the capital, over 200 Russians were reported killed by Afghan rebels. It wasn't an atmosphere for good press relations, and soon our crew found itself under temporary arrest. Later on, the crew did go to Corporal Prison, but not as inmates. Word had spread that President Carmel was releasing political prisoners detained by President Amin. Soon, crowds were streaming in from all directions. Everyone was a friend or relative of a detainee, and their numbers gave ample evidence of the severity of the former president's rule. In fact, it's estimated that as many as 10,000 political prisoners were released in a single day. The prison's name means gateway to the sky, but Afghans often referred to it as the gateway to heaven, a grim reminder of those who died within its walls. If President Carmel had ousted Amin without Soviet help, he would certainly have been a hero for these people. In the midst of all the upheavals and violence, it was a moment of jubilation and at times almost overpowering emotion. <laughs> Among the joy, though, there was tragedy for those who didn't find the relative they sought. For this woman, it was her husband. And when all was over, a despairing wave from those not released. Corbel returned to normal. At least, that's how Soviet TV saw it. This was the film report from Moscow's man on the spot.
The commentary says, it's all been quiet and normal, both in Kabul and other areas of Afghanistan. In the capital, shops are open and all government institutions are functioning. According to this report, in Kabul, as in the provinces, the population welcomed the changes. Provincial governors, army officers and noted public figures have all expressed their support for the new leadership. At this building site, the Soviet reporter spoke to foreman Mohammed Ayub. This is what he said. Afghanistan has now been cleansed of the Amin scum and the genuine revolutionary forces are now in power. The Afghan people support the new leadership. Soviet soldiers and officers are temporarily stationed in our country at the invitation of our government, and we see them as representatives of the great friendly nation that came to our aid at the most difficult period of our struggle for freedom and independence. This fraternal aid of the Soviet Union to our people is especially important now that we are waging a grim battle against the forces of imperialism and reaction. Just how many Afghans would echo those sentiments is a matter now that's open to question. Most reports seem to point the other way, providing a picture of sullen acceptance in the major towns and widespread resistance elsewhere. Afghanistan is a deeply conservative country where the basic patterns of life are bound up with the laws of Islam. And that's just where the trouble lies. What's been happening over the past two years is that the Marxist regimes in Kabul have been trying to force through radical changes in the economy and in society. And they've been trying to do it at a pace which most Afghans simply can't accept. Away from the main towns, many Afghans still lead the traditional life. With camels still the best means of transport, and with flocks of sheep providing a vital source of food and clothing. Only one million of Afghanistan's population of 15 million live in towns. The vast majority live in scattered villages. The recent fighting has now made nomads of many of them. Here in the west of the country, towards the border with Iran, as many as 100,000 Afghans are living virtually as refugees. Mostly one sees young children, women and old people. The men are further away in the rugged interior, living the life of guerrilla fighters. Spokesmen for the rebels in the Iran border area say that international aid has been reaching refugees in the east along the Pakistani border. But here, they say, no supplies are coming through. These people do have one advantage. They've been brought up to be self-sufficient. Independence is in their blood. Home comforts and technology, regarded as essential elsewhere, are almost unknown here. Their money goes on guns with just the occasional luxury of motorized transport. Life then is hard, especially for the refugees. As the Soviet troops and the forces of the new regime push out into the provinces, there will be more and more temporary camps to be seen. But one can expect the old lifestyles to flourish. Even under such circumstances as these, anything foreign is mistrusted. The nomads and the mountain villagers agree with the leaders of the political and religious opposition. Afghan traditions must be maintained. The old handicrafts are passed on from generation to generation, maintaining a workmanship that has become famous the world over. Now the carpets are being sold to buy supplies to fight the new Corbel leadership. With the worst of winter yet to come, life is going to get even more uncomfortable for families in the camps.
the weather will be even more of a hazard for the men who have joined the guerrilla forces. They try to keep on the move, never staying long in one camp to avoid detection and possible attack. And they can be remarkably mobile, even using the humblest beasts of burden. Around a campfire, the guerrillas would tell us little about their own casualties. They do say, though, that they are prepared to die, and they have scorned staying in defensive positions when firing on Russian convoys, often paying for their boldness with their own life. Their leader of operations in this region is a former two-star general who used to be a commander in the Afghan Air Force. He joined the rebels early in 1978 after the first pro-Moscow coup which brought Taraki to power. The practice of Islam is central to the former general's thinking. Like many others now fighting in opposition, he wants a free Afghanistan. But he made it clear that for him, the right to practice Islam must be sacrosanct. These people are Sunni Muslims, generally more reserved than their Shia brethren in Iran, but equally committed to their faith. Further eastwards into Afghanistan, a disturbing pattern emerged. Village after village lay totally deserted, most of them abandoned by the Afghan farmers months ago before the latest coup. The guerrillas claim the simple clay buildings were systematically bombed and machine-gunned by Soviet jets in low-level attacks. And there have even been allegations that bombs of nerve gas and napalm have been dropped. Such attacks were almost certainly on the orders of the previous leader, President Amin, as part of his brutal campaign against dissidents. But it's the Russians who also get blamed by those who have lost their homes. Groups of guerrillas are the only people around here now seeking temporary shelter. Their weapons, this one clearly dated 1893 with British markings, amaze the foreign visitor. Rifles such as these have been used for decades against anyone who incurred the displeasure of the mountain men. Today, it's the Russians and Babrak Karmel's Marxist regime. But in the past, it could equally have been other tribal groups. Internal disputes have been one of the main causes of the failure of successive attempts to unite and govern the country. Even before the fall of Amin, rebel forces were said to control 22 of the country's 28 provinces. There were also hundreds of Russian advisers already in the country at the invitation of the successive pro-Moscow government since 1978. These advisers were in the armed forces, the civil administration, and in the important natural gas fields in the north, another reason for Soviet interest. And they became a clear target for the rebel forces, variously described in Korbel as Muslim, nationalist, or ultra-left extremists. About a hundred Russians were reportedly massacred in incidents at Herat and Jalalabad. And during the past year, it's estimated that nearly a thousand Soviet citizens and some East Europeans have been variously shot, tortured to death, or even flayed alive. Some were beheaded, and their heads paraded on poles by the unforgiving Afghans. Around a campfire deeper in the mountains, the guerrillas were reluctant to talk about alleged atrocities. But they did claim some amazing acts of bravery by dead comrades. Some, they said, had attacked tanks by dousing themselves with gasoline, deliberately setting fire to themselves, and then jumping onto the turrets or engine casing of the tanks, destroying the machines and themselves. The makeshift footwear worn by the rebels emphasizes how poorly equipped they are in the face of the modern Soviet army. Yet they are still well enough equipped to carry out classic guerrilla warfare, each carrying his own weapon carefully checked whenever they rest. Comparisons are being made between the Afghan rebels fighting the Russians and the Viet Cong against the Americans in the Vietnam War. 
In both cases, a big power moved in to support an unpopular government for political reasons and to widespread protests from the outside world. But the comparison doesn't go much further. The Afghans are not well equipped. They are scattered and almost impossible to unite. And they have no burning political ideology like the Viet Cong. They operate best in small groups and in their home, the mountains. <laughs> Warned by their mountain telegraph, lookouts had spotted the distant approach of a Russian convoy. It was attacked, and the rebels said two of the 15 trucks had been knocked out and several Russians killed. They take no prisoners. This truck, we were told, was a captured Russian vehicle. Now it's used to ferry around supplies and ammunition for the rebels. It also provided lifts for our camera team. In the winter months, the hazards of travel in these parts multiply. The hard-baked desert can become a bog. The rebels have to move along primitive paths because the Russians control the surfaced roads. There is also the constant threat of being seen from the air, when even a rough shepherd's track shows up like a clear thread through the rocks. In their mountain fastnesses, then, the rebels appear to be able to hold out as long as they can maintain supplies. Skirmishes up here are never likely to be decisive. But it is equally certain that the Soviet troops will never be driven back across the Oxus River by force of arms. What the guerrillas can do is tie down their foe in a long and indecisive war. They can maintain their independence and satisfy their fierce pride. And that is a kind of victory. Here in Iran, a modern road runs up to the Afghan border, across Afghanistan, through the towering Hindu Kush range to the Khyber Pass, then down into the Indian subcontinent. It's modern communications, and Western intelligence used to receive a lot of information on events in Afghanistan from this part of Iran. After the Islamic Revolution, though, these sources all but dried up, and Russian activities across the border haven't been monitored in depth from here for months. The hostility against alleged American spying in Iran has seen to that. One source of information our reporter did find in Iran was an Afghan student leader who has been closely following recent events. He managed to record the first radio announcement of the ousting of Armin, heard on the Soviet Uzbekistan radio. But he insists that the broadcast was made before the fighting around Korbel had finished. That says this is Radio Uzbekistan. That's Radio Uzbekistan, I know. It says that today uh, Radio Kabul uh, broadcast uh, Babrak's uh, speech, which is not true because at the same time that we were listening to this, we heard Radio Kabul broadcasting its ordinary uh, program. So it's not possible. That, uh, for uh, Radio Kabul to have broadcast this one. So you're saying that the Russians on their own state radio were saying the coup had occurred before there'd been any movement inside Kabul? Uh, I don't say before there was any movement. I think there was fighting at that time, but there, uh, they were not successful yet, and they didn't have the radio station, Kabul radio station, at that time. But they were saying this to, uh, to spread the news that there has been a coup, and that was not, that's not true. So as far as you and the other people who are fighting to provide an Islamic state in Afghanistan, yes. the people who oppose the Russians, mm -hmm. you believe this was a Russian invasion? That is a uh, uh, Russian invasion and we expect you, Western and other news media people, to understand this and don't call it a coup. It is an invasion and it should be called as an invasion. 
Are you saying then... Many Afghan exiles in Iran have lived through the Islamic Revolution there. As they demonstrate in Tehran against Soviet actions, religious as well as political feelings are forcefully expressed. This demonstration against Soviet policies shows how the revived Islamic militancy cuts across international borders. A warning which even the strongest powers can only ignore at their peril. Scenes like this were echoed in cities in India, Pakistan and even in Europe. Coupled with widespread governmental disapproval around the world, it adds up to a considerable loss in Soviet prestige. But the full price was much higher than that. As Soviet President Brezhnev swung in effigy from the gallows along with his new Afghan protégé, the real President Brezhnev was counting the cost of a very different reckoning, the damage to East-West relations. It's barely seven months since the Soviet leader was in Vienna to sign with President Carter the SALT II agreement on arms limitation. The agreement was desperately wanted by the Russians, not only for reasons of détente, but also to reduce the soaring costs of the arms race. The treaty faced a difficult passage through the US Senate even before, but the Afghan crisis has killed any chance it had. It's assumed that President Brezhnev considered SALT II was doomed anyway, and that Russia is now quite prepared for a period of colder relations with the West. For the moment at least, the hugs and kisses are over. <laughs> President Carter's problem was how to hit back, and this is one of the ways he's chosen. American grain has become increasingly important to the Russians, especially as cattle feed. President Carter put a ban on millions of tons of promised grain, but even American experts doubt its effectiveness. And in election year, the president faces opposition from Midwestern farmers who've always opposed political curbs on their sales. Another possible weapon was a boycott of the Moscow Olympics, on which the Russians have spent millions. President Carter hinted at it, but Olympic officials and athletes all over the world are firmly against it. One country, Saudi Arabia, has actually withdrawn from the Games. But most governments, it appears, would like to keep politics out of the Olympics. Since then, President Carter has added technology to the list of banned exports. But it's difficult to see how any of these sanctions can really bite. As the world argues about their fate, the Afghan rebels have just one objective, to continue the fight. Most of them are doing it in the name of Islam, but their lack of unity is a serious drawback. In the past, they've given bloody noses to invaders ranging from Alexander the Great to the British Raj. But now, for the first time, they're facing a highly mechanized superpower who can fight not just on the ground, but from the air and their chances of success are slim, to say the least.